Welcome back students to Unit 8 Chemistry, Thermochemistry and Gases. Today we will be talking about Unit 8.6 Gas Laws. Unit 8 is particularly challenging because there are eight formulas that you have to have memorized in order to pass this exam. And so we've already talked about a couple of them. We've already talked about how you can calculate the energy transferred into a system by taking the amount of stuff, the specific heat, and how the temperature changes. Now that's if you're changing kinetic energy. If you're changing potential energy, that energy transferred is simply when we go through a phase change. So we take the heat of the phase change times the amount of stuff. These are the first two, again, of eight formulas you have to know for this unit. The rest are held up in what are known as gas laws, phenomenon that ideal gases always exhibit. So the first person that we're going to talk about who noticed a principle of gases that always occurs was John Dalton, the same John Dalton that gave us the atomic theory back in unit one. John Dalton noted that when you have a mixture of gases, that gas's total pressure is equal to the parts that make it up. So if one gas has a partial pressure of five and another gas has a partial pressure of 10, then the total pressure within a container, as long as it's the same size, is 15, because 10 plus five is 15. So in example six, if we have a mixture of gases with a total pressure of 10, so the total pressure being 10, and the partial pressure of A is five, and the partial pressure of B is three, what is the partial pressure of the third gas? Well, the total pressure would have to be the sum of all the gases in that container. So if we want C by itself, we'd have to subtract A and B from both sides. giving us that the partial pressure of C would be if we took the total pressure and subtracted the partial pressure of A and B. So 10 minus 5 minus 3. So the partial pressure of gas C would be 1.6 atmospheres. Now that's kind of juvenile. In fact, you actually learned this law, Dalton's law, in eighth grade physical science. But most of the time when we talk about gases in this class, we're going to talk about the percent of a system that is a particular gas. So for that, if you took the percent that is that gas and you multiplied it by the total pressure, that will tell you the partial pressure of that particular gas within a system. So that within that system, what percentage of the gas are you looking at? So in example six, part B, when it says breathable air is 16% oxygen, what is the partial pressure of oxygen at standard conditions in Tor? So we have a percent. We know that the oxygen around us makes up 16% of our atmosphere. At standard conditions means next to the ocean. If you're at sea level, you're at one atmosphere. But they want to know specifically in Tor. So one atmosphere, you remember, is 760 Tor. So if we want the partial pressure of oxygen, we can take the total pressure and multiply by the percent oxygen in the atmosphere. So we're going to take 760 Tor and multiply it by 16%. Now, you're smart, you're pretty, gosh darn it, people like you. You know that percentages are a mathematical operant. This does not mean we're going to take 760 and multiply by 16. We're going to take 760 and multiply by 16%, 16 for every 100. So 760 times 16% is 122 Tor. So the oxygen around you is has enough force to push mercury up 122 millimeters or 122 tor. That's how much oxygen itself is pushing down on you. Dalton's law problems are the most commonly tested question on the SOL and therefore your first four note quiz questions for unit 8.6 
has you doing Dalton's Law problems. Read the question, look at the percentage they're talking about. Then you can practice Dalton's Law on page 13 of your Unit 8 packet. Your answer to number 2 is what you start with for the total pressure in number 3. Pause the video, complete page 13, as well as the first four note quiz questions of 8.6. Another phenomenon that we notice with gases is that when you, when you reduce the pressure of a gas, the volume of that gas increases. So the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume of a gas. When pressure goes up, volume goes down. When volume goes up, pressure decreases. This proportionality we attribute to Robert Boyles, the Irish philosopher and chemist and inventor who looked at this mathematically. When you have a proportion, you can actually replace proportions with a constant. So pressure is some constant times the inverse of volume. To put things all in the same place, if we multiply by volume on both sides, when a gas is ideal, if you take the pressure times the volume, you always end up with some constant. So if I have some pressure and some volume and I change it to some new pressure, the volume has to change it, change with it because the constants are always the same. So Boyle's law problems are often, will often have a solve for the pressure and volume after a change. So they'll say you have some pressure and the volume changed, or you have some volume and the ch pressure changed. How does the new volume play out? These are Boyle's law problems. So pressure times volume will always equal pressure times volume. So if I have a balloon that's filled to half a milliliter with one atmosphere of air and it's placed in a vacuum and the balloon expands to a thousand milliliters, what is the pressure within the vacuum? I've got a volume and a pressure in the same sentence, so they must go together. And then I have a new volume and I'm asked for a new pressure. This is a Boyle's Law problem. Pressure times volume has to equal the pressure times the volume. So to solve for P2 by itself, we'll divide by V2 on both sides. We'll divide by our new volume. So the pressure times the volume divided by our new volume will tell us what the pressure is within the container. So we'll simply plug and chug. One atmosphere times 500 milliliters divided by 1,000 milliliters tells us the pressure within the va vacuum is a half. Milliliters cancel out, so half an atmosphere. A hot air balloon is filled at standard pressure and temperature with 50 liters of nitrogen gas at an altitude of 30,000 feet. The pressure in the balloon drops to 226 millimeters of mercury. What is the new volume of the balloon if temperature remains the same? When you see STP, remember STP is a shorthand for lots of information. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius and standard pressure is one atmosphere. So by saying STP, by putting that abbreviation there, I'm telling you both a temperature and a pressure that you are starting at. So here's the volume we start at. At 30,000 feet in this class, we have yet to talk about location, so altitude must not really be part of this problem. The pressure in the balloon drops to 226 millimeters of mercury, so I have a new pressure. What is the new volume? So I'm solving for V2. So the pressure times the volume has to equal the pressure times the volume. If I want V2 by itself, I divide by P2 on both sides, my new pressure. So the original pressure times the original volume divided by my new pressure will tell me what the new volume is. So my first volume, my first pressure was one atmosphere. My first volume was 50 liters. And my new pressure is 226 millimeters of mercury. My answer isn't going to work because I have 
atmospheres dividing by millimeters of mercury, my pressure unit doesn't go away. I need to end up with a volume, which is going to be in liters. Liters make sense. These other units do not cancel out. And that's because while one atmosphere was the pressure we started at, because that's standard temperature and pressure, there's lots of ways to say one atmosphere. So another way to say one atmosphere is to say 760 millimeters of mercury. These are the same value, just expressed with different units. So my first pressure is not one atmosphere, it's actually 760 millimeters of mercury, and that way millimeters of mercury cancels out, and I'm left with liters which is a volume. So my new volume is 168 liters. So your next three note quiz questions for unit 8.6 is about Boyle's Law, the, the relationship between pressure and volume. Pause the video and complete unit 8.6 note quiz questions 5, 6, and 7. Another phenomenon we notice with gases is that when you heat up a gas, it expands. We attribute this to Charles. Charles was a French inventor and scientist. He was particularly interested in hot air balloons, and there's a really interesting story about that, but for another time. Charles found that the volume and the temperature of a gas are proportional. When you increase the temperature of a gas, the volume went up with it. When you cool a gas down, it contracts and the volume goes down. So volume and temperature are proportional. Again, when you have a proportionality, you can replace proportionalities with a constant. So volume equals some constant times temperature. If I want to solve for that constant, I could divide by T on both sides to get that the volume divided by the temperature always yielded the same constant for a gas that is ideal. Now the kicker here is that Charles did his experiments in France in the winter, which means that it could have been snowing. If you take the volume and divide by zero degrees Celsius, you end up with a constant that is undefined. So we can never use degrees Celsius. The temperature we use for this formula is always going to be in Kelvin. So from here forward, for the remainder of this unit, you are forbidden from using Celsius. There will be no Celsius. If we ever talk about a gas, that gas is not in Celsius. You must convert it to Kelvin. So anytime you see degree C, add 273 and then your formulas will work. So if we have the volume and we divide by the temperature, it will always equal a constant, or the volume divided by the temperature has to equal the volume divided by the temperature. So a gas balloon is filled at a volume of three and a half liters at standard temperature and pressure. Remember, that's shorthand for zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Wait a minute. Professor, you just said there's no such thing as degrees Celsius, and that's right. When you see degrees C, you're going to add 273. So my temperature here is 273 Kelvin. If the pressure remains constant, but the balloon is heated to 25 degrees Celsius, nope, that's not a thing. We don't use degrees Celsius when talking about gases. So this is 298 Kelvin. What is the new volume of the balloon? So I've got a temperature I start at with a volume I start at, and then a new temperature. I want to know what is the new volume? What did the balloon expand to? Because we heated it up. So volume divided by temperature will always equal the volume divided by the temperature. If I want V2 by itself, I have to multiply by my new temperature. So T2s cancel out, and I get the first volume times my new temperature divided by my original temperature will tell me the new volume of the balloon, in which case it's just a matter of plugging in. Three and a half liters times 298 Kelvin divided by 273 Kelvin will give me the new volume of the balloon, which is 3.8 Kelvins cancel out, so 3.8 liters is the new volume of the balloon. 
A balloon is inflated at one atmosphere with 300 milliliters of air at 27 degrees Celsius. Again, there is no such thing. We're going to add 273, so 27 plus 273. We're starting at 300 Kelvin. When it's dropped into a pool of liquid nitrogen, the volume drops to 76.9 milliliters. What is the temperature of the liquid nitrogen? Our volume divided by our temperature must equal our new volume divided by its temperature. So to get T2 by itself, I'll cross multiply, giving me V1 times my new temperature will give me my new volume times the original temperature. To get T2 by itself, I'll divide by V1 on both sides. So my new temperature, the temperature of liquid nitrogen, would be the origin, would be the new volume times the original temperature divided by the original volume. So 76.9 milliliters times 300 Kelvin divided by 300 milliliters. Well, isn't that a coincidence? Milliliters cancel out, but so do 300. The temperature of my liquid nitrogen is 76.9 Kelvin. The question specifically asks though, what is this in degrees Celsius? So to go from degrees C to Kelvin, we add 273. To go backwards, we'll subtract 273. For a Celsius reading of a negative 196 degrees Celsius, which would be a negative 321 degrees Fahrenheit. Liquid nitrogen is very cold. No quiz question number eight and number nine is about Charles Law. For number eight, you will need to fill in the blank for what the new volume is. Pause the video, answer number eight and nine for unit 8.6 note quiz questions. On number eight, give me three numbers. Leading zeros do not count as numbers. So if your answer was 121.78, that would be 122. Or if your answer came out to be 0 0.135, your answer would be 0 0.135. Leading zeros don't count, so always give me three numbers for these. Pause the video and complete note quiz question number eight and nine for unit 8.6. Our final gas law deals with the work of Gay-Lussac, a French chemist and phys physicist who heated gases in a closed container. As the gases heated up, their molecules moved faster and faster and exerted a greater pressure. So Gay-Lussac found that the pressure was proportional to the temperature, and again, when you have a proportionality, you can replace it with a constant. In order to solve for that constant, you could divide by T on both sides. So the pressure divided by the temperature always yields some constant. Pressure and temperature are proportional to one another. When the pressure, when the temperature went up, pressure goes up with it. There are no note quiz questions on Gay-Lussac's Gay law. You simply need to know that pressure and temperature are proportional. When pressure goes, when temperature goes up, pressure goes up as well. So we have now gone over three additional formulas. Remember, we started by saying, okay, you need to know energy transfer, but now we've got Boyle's law, we've got Charles law, and while you're never gonna have to calculate it, we have Gay-Lussac's law. Needless to say, this can get really confusing very quickly. So personally, I, do not memorize all of these gas laws. Instead, I put them together. Pressure, volume, and temperature. Three of the four ways we can talk about gases all relate to one another in some way. If we mush our gas laws together, if we combine them, you don't have to memorize every single one. So the combined gas law is a combination of all the gas laws we've talked about. Pressure times volume was Boyle's law, the volume divided by the temperature was Charles' law, and Gay-Lussac's was the pressure divided by the temperature. So if we were to take the pressure, volume, and temperature and divide them, 
we would always end up with the same constant. So if pressure, volume, or temperature changes, the other two have to change with it. This leads to the combined gas law. PV over T equals PV over T. Now, personally, I don't love fractions. So when I work with the combined gas law, I work with it in a straight line by cross multiplying. Pressure, volume, and temperature equals pressure, volume, and temperature with you just flipping your temperatures. So I remember it as PVT equals PVT 112221. And if you do that, this helps you remember whose law is who. We learned about Boyle's, Charles, and Gay Lussac's. If you remember PVT equals PVT 112221, they're in alphabetical order. Boyle's looked at pressure and volume. Charles looked at volume and temperature. And Gay Lussac's looked at pressure and temperature. So if you remember them in alphabetical order, you remember whose law goes with who in case you're ever asked that trivia question. Additionally, the combined gas law allows you to do all the others. If you get a problem that says temperature remains constant, simply remove temperature and you're dealing with a Boyle's law problem. If it says that the reaction occurs in a rigid container, that means the volume's not going to change. You're dealing with a gay lussex problem. Or if it says that the experiment occurred in the same location and pressure was constant, you're dealing with a Charles Law problem. The combined gas law gets you all the others without having to memorize each one individually. So let's do a combined gas law problem in which, all of, in which everything changes. A toy balloon has an internal pressure of one atmosphere. So I've got a pressure I'm starting at and a volume of five liters. So I've got a volume to start at. If the balloon is released at 20 degrees Celsius, what happens to the volume? So we're looking for a new volume. We've got a temperature here, but we don't know if it's our first temperature or second. What happens to the volume of the balloon when the balloon rises to an altitude where the pressure drops to half an atmosphere, so I've got a new pressure, and the temperature drops, so I've got a new temperature, so this must be the temperature I start at. Again, anytime you see degree C, you go, nope, degree C plus 273, so this is 293. Degree C plus 273, this is 258. So PVT equals PVT 112221. If I want V2 by itself, I have to divide by P2 and T1 on both sides. Giving me that the new volume would be if I took the first pressure and volume and the new temperature and divide by the new pressure and the temperature I started at. So I'll take 1.05 times 5 times 258 divided by 0.65 and 2.93. Kelvins cancel out and atmospheres cancel out, so my volume is going to be in liters, so I end up with 7.11 liters. Your final note quiz question has less to do with the combined gas law and more to do with, hey, can you picture what happens to the pressure and why it occurs when we push down on a piston? Finish note quiz question number 10 and then do lots of practice on combined gas laws. Remember if it says something is constant remove it from the formula. So do page 18, 19, and 22 in your packet and I will see you next time when we talk about the ideal gas law.